So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is the afternoon session. Uh, this is really around uh, recruitment technology. Um, I guess in terms of the, the theme, it's you know how technology as an inhibitor has potentially become an enabler, certainly now in the, the current change um, in uh, the recent months. Um, we'll do some intros uh, across the panel now so you know who, uh, who's here, uh, who you're talking to. Um, we have an agenda um, in terms of some discussion points and I'll work us through that collectively. Um, if you do have a question um, that's relevant or, or a comment that's relevant to what we're discussing, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, you can do so in your little control box there. Um, and then what I'll do is at the appropriate time, I'll bring you in. You can ask your question if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. And that'd be really helpful for us. And um, we want to make this as inclusive as possible. So please participation, um, ask away, raise hands. If you have a question um, that either isn't relevant to the current topic in discussion or something that you feel that you want to have us follow up on, please do drop it in the chat uh, and then we'll do our best to capture that uh, and obviously follow up uh, in due course, if that's okay. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll go around the virtual table uh, and start with introductions. Uh, Lisa, if you'd like to introduce yourself, followed by Andy, and then lastly, Han. Hi, I'm Lisa Barkley jones I work with recruiters, have done for a number of years now on their technology, their training, and their marketing. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as, as Rob just said, my name is Andy Ingham. Um, I am the VP of sales at, at Bullhorn. I've got geographical responsibility for our EMEA uh, and APAC business. Um, and Bullhorn, very pleased to be a, a premium sponsor of REC 2020 today. Um, I, I, for anyone who's not familiar with Bullhorn, just a um, quick explanation. So primarily our flagship product is recruitment CRM. And we're supporting a, around 11,000 clients on a daily basis there. But Bullhorn's so much more than a CRM. If anyone's interested in finding out about Bullhorn and the applications that we bring specifically to the agency market, then not now, but after this session, please, uh, by all means, head over to the Expo Hall. Um, we'll be able to meet some of the team and, and kind of pick up the, uh, pick up the conversation. Um, Bullhorn's 21 years young. I've, uh, I've been with Bullhorn for the last seven years. Um, I'm normally based in London, but... Lockdown restrictions um, and, and office closures uh, have headed me home to Lancashire. Super pleased to be joining the panel today and participating in this conversation. Thanks, Andy. Oh yeah, hey everybody. Um, welcome, I'm gonna just sort my camera out. Um, uh, my name is Hung Lee. I basically write a newsletter called Recruiting Brain Food. Um, also manage a few communities for the recruiting business. Uh, Recruitingbrainfood.com goes out every Sunday. Uh, tens of thousands of people sign up to it. Hopefully some of you guys in the uh, audience are too. Um, uh, but yeah, delighted to be part of this uh, panel and looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you guys. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, so, and just just to note, um, although I did say raise your hand, um, there is no raising of hands available in this uh, Zoom technology. Um, apologies, I'm used to using <laughs> Microsoft Teams. Um, so that's a question for another time. Um, so um, thank you, and myself, finally, uh, Rob Fairbrother. Uh, so I work at Microsoft. Um, I'm part of the business applications team, uh, and I focus on the recruitment and consultancy industry. Uh, I'm very, very heavily focused around building, I guess, Microsoft's brand and presence um, within this sector. Uh, I guess it'd be fair to say we're quite young uh, in terms of our uh, branding and solutions. Uh, and my job is to obviously drive and promote that and build. Uh, those solutions to uh, help you guys achieve more and you know connect um, with your candidates and clients. So with further ado, uh, I'll ask the first topic here uh, and then what we do is I'll make the statement, I'll propose the statement to the panel. Uh, as I say, um, there's no hand raising so if you want to raise a comment please drop it in the chat and I'll do my best to facilitate that within the uh, discussion. Um, so the first topic is, um, and this is quite close to everyone, and certainly should be, uh, with the, the amount of change in everyone's work life. Um, the statement is technologies for monitoring performance, well-being, um, and staff engagement. You know, what are the must-haves uh, versus the good-to-haves, um, and why? And I guess I'll, I'll start with, um, I guess, my journey uh, into Microsoft. Um, I started back in February when everything was normal. Um, 
And I was really excited about joining a big company like that. I'd done my onboarding. I'd gone through the, the process. And, um, you know, I wanted to go and see the big building and meet everyone. And I did. Uh, and I was very fortunate to do that. Then everything changed. And, uh, you know, we were all sent home. And it really hit me, uh, you know, personally and uh, the, the way I am as a worker as well. I love being in the office. I love being around people. And, and it did actually impact my performance. Um, it really you know, challenged me on my you know, attitude and my kind of get up and go and actually being part of the company as well, um, fitting into that culture. And as a new starter, that was you know, obviously really important to me, but it's very important to my employer as well. Um, but we've obviously, as a technology company, we've got an advantage there to a degree to, to address that. And we went through some things around digitally onboarding, having inclusion sessions and things like that. So, so that was my experience. Um, so it's really important to me and I can come back on some what those technologies are. But I guess, Lisa, I wanted to put it to you in terms of t- training, um, you know, the, the skills, not just the skills, but also the technology to use. How, how have you seen that adapt in, in what you're telling uh, recruiters and, and people of the likes on, on their role? <coughs> Mm, I've got a stat for you. Two thirds of the people that quit their jobs before COVID, and not all of these stats are pre-COVID. There's the stats that we've got right now are too covid for us to talk about. But pre-COVID, which we want to get back to, or ideally better than after COVID, uh, was two thirds of recruiters who quit their jobs um, last year said that they'd not had the best training or the most effective training to deliver their commission, to, to, to earn the money they want to earn. And as someone who's been in technology for 20 years and in recruitment for 20 years, looking at this and saying, right, what is, the, what is the story I'm constantly hearing? Now, obviously, as a consultant into the industry, I only work with recruiters that are that feel that they've got a problem and they need it fixing. So I'm, I'm, I'm limited in my scope. But the market is very happy to spend a lot of money on technology. And over the years, it's invested more and more and more in technology. And by the way, great stuff. However, what we're seeing now is a lack of budget to get the humans to be as effective as possible. We hear the word automation an awful lot. Um, We see opportunities to buy lots of extra technology to compensate for a lack of user adoption, which I sit on the outside and I go, this is just crazy town. What COVID has taught us is that actually by sending people on furlough or reducing their ability to bill by not allowing them to work the hours that they want to work. Working from home is great, but potentially not bringing them back full time. Training has become absolutely critical to uh, recruiters being effective, whether they're at the desks, working from home, working on a bus, or doing all three on the same day because something's happened. So I think now more than ever, that two third stat that was shocking anyway, uh, six to 12 months ago, we really need to look that in the eye of Are we over investing in our technology? Are we under investing in the people that make it work? Because ultimately, we will only deliver great process and great bills or billings if our systems deliver great processes and our humans deliver the great systems. And I'm kind of like, that's my sound bite is stop over investing in technology and under investing in staff. For us to come out of this uh, with a bit of a slingshot, we need to look at our staff and go, let's admit we weren't great before the recession um, as an industry in terms of our processes weren't brilliant. We've got an opportunity to fix that right now with some really good training. Yeah, I think I agree. It's, it's almost like a, an opportunity to accelerate uh, a lot of that transformation, but not through one dimension. Uh, it yeah. must be over more people, process, technology, and, and clients even as well. I guess, Hunt, to you, I, I read a couple of the articles. It was interesting to, to the, um, the point that Lisa raised around automation being almost driven by technology. I think there was a... There was a um, a big company that has lots of warehouses around the world and we all buy stuff from uh, religiously. Um, they went through employment processes where they didn't even have human interaction at all. And it's, are you seeing trends around certain job types where that's happening more? Oh, you're on mute, Hung. Thank you, Pan. Trying to be polite. Um, um, so I think you've got to look at it from the CFO, CEO point of view. Uh, ultimately, they're going to see automation as an opportunity to Im- improve efficiency, which ultimately means saving money um, and getting more for the, for, 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 the, for the investment that they do put in. Um, Amazon, probably an extreme example because they're highly te- uh, sort of a highly technical business and a lot of the jobs that, that are in 
Amazon are fairly mechanical, fairly rep re repetitive, fairly routine. Um, so there's probably not an example that is uh, particularly close to recruitment agency, let's say. Um, however, it's kind of like an interesting to compare, if you like, the in extremists, what it looks like when you have um, a company is committed to technology and is actively automating a lot, away a lot of uh, a lot of jobs. So, yeah, it's fascinating. I think you can do a lot of things without um, the, the human being being there. Um, the example that you cited was this individual. I think he got hired uh, to do a job without a single human being speaking to him, um, uh, which is uh, you know fascinating from a recruiter point of view, um, uh, uh, because. Uh, Amazon had automated every single step of the process, including the assessment, the scheduling, the start, the offer, uh, everything. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of uh, uh, is a very serious example for us to, uh, to digest and think about. And I think that's, I guess, where I was leading with that. That's the, that's the kind of, as you say, an extreme. But then I guess, so Andy, to you, how do we find the balance? And, and to Lisa's point where we take that kind of multi-dimensional approach to not just simply think, we need to spend money on technology and it's going to help us. Now we can't you know, see people, we can't interact in that same way. Is, is there a balance um, that, that we must find a balance? Is there an approach to finding that balance um, in, in your experience, especially, I guess, leading into things like ATS and you know, things that are quite complex and, and valuable um, to Hans' point around the CFO and ultimately the money coming in? Um, yes, is, is I guess the short answer, and I think I, I um, vehemently agree with with kind of Lisa's comment there around that that balance of fuel in terms of investment between technology and and training itself. Super interesting to kind of wind back to to the pre COVID example, if you will, that that Lisa gave there around. Um, you know, it's almost like the you know the tech stack became a measure of an agency's worth or, or internal HR department's worth. Well, actually the, you know, the big value is in, is in that front office technology itself. It's kind of the data and how you use and, and your users, your recruiters and your sales folks actually adopt that data itself. So, you, you know, for me, technology itself has a big part to play in that in terms of the adoption, um, you know, making it user friendly will, um, we'll, we'll kind of use the LinkedIn example here, like who, who's ever been on a training session to sort of use LinkedIn or, or, or Facebook and, you know, other such technologies there, you know, the, the UIs are intuitive. Um, you can generally sort of like navigate yourself around the screen and sort of like, you know, engage and, and interact with the technology. But, you know, that's only, that's only part of the story. You know, there's human interaction here, training um, and, and adoption of that technology is like super important in terms of, in terms of kind of advancing that. And, you know, kind of jumping around a little bit here, but if we if we kind of again cast our minds back to pre-COVID, I would say probably one of the largest buzz phrases, so like in the industry, was was around digital transformation, of which Hung kind of touched on on automation. Then that's that's only a part of that that digital transformation journey. Um, but you know, as we as we're now kind of operating in our new norm with you know, as, as many sort of like varying statistics as we can gather to, to kind of throw out what the world looks like today. Um, I, I do genuinely believe that automation has a key part to play in this, but it is a part, it's not a finite solution. You know, adopt an automation platform or an automation solution and, and all your troubles go away. That, that's not the case. I don't think there's a single business case for any piece of technology that's been, that's been written in, along those lines. Um, but, um, but I do believe generally that automation plays a big role for us as an industry moving forward. Um, you know, taking away some of that mundane work, not maybe looking at the, you know, the Amazon example of, of having that recruiterless process, but, you know, taking, taking the mundane operation and, and even extending, you know, the current parameters of how agencies engage and interact with, you know, clients, contacts, and, and potential prospects so that you can drive more value in the human interaction or create more time in the process for that human interaction. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a really valid point because ultimately, you know, we are 
technology should be harmonizing uh, that process and making it, you know, and enriching the time we spend when we can actually interact. Uh, I think that's really, really important. And it's things like this where, you know, typically events like this would be canceled or not even happen. And we have the ability to still, to a degree, um, humanize the, uh, the interaction and obviously, uh, you know, engage with our audiences, um, albeit remotely as well. The final point on this was around, I guess, um, you know, technology is part playing within the process. But what about, you know, I guess as a as an employer um, and the wellness um, and the kind of, you know, that kind of interaction from a, you know, an employee. So where I think around, you know, all of a sudden, um, a Deco as an example, you know, they have a, a fair few thousand employees that were in a number of offices that are now in, you know, nearly twenty five. A thousand offices remotely you know how as a as a business how do you support that if your email doesn't work or you know if your payroll isn't correct and things like that you know technology does build a, a massive layer in terms of the automation part to from a productivity perspective to keep those people working because you are in isolation right you are at home uh, how do you ensure as a business um, that you have access to those services or you can provide those services to that individual em employee remotely so they can still be working. Because the biggest fear, I, I think, for a lot of uh, people is that if something breaks, they stop working, you they're, not <laughs> they're at home, you know, and if the weather's good, they might want to go outside and enjoy the sunshine or they might panic and not know what to do. Um, so I think technology, uh, and certainly from my experience, we've got a, a very good system of uh, automating a lot of um, inquiries and concerns that doesn't bottleneck, you know, HR or legal um, in the back office. So we, we have the mechanisms to help. And I think that is a good example of where automation and technology can help uh, industries and, and certainly in the recruitment industry, if there's issues around, you know, kind of you know, mundane kind of HR or back office processes, but in some respects, they're not in front of customers. We can automate that to ensure that they're still as productive as possible. Um, any examples that you guys have seen, I guess, in, in your own companies as well, and Andy, I may, may be leaning on you, similar business there. Uh, have you seen some of that um, change in uh, sort of back office support? Yeah, I'll, um, let, let, me, let me answer two sides of the coin on this one because uh, from a personal perspective when when we all kind of went down into dreaded lockdown you know back in back in March um, you know you try to carry on life as normal and I was I'm kind of not going to name any names here but I was quite amazed at um, you know some of the companies that I contacted just through normal so like consumer life so retailers um, that you know couldn't answer the phone or couldn't answer a particular question because that department you know, was off because of coronavirus. And it was, you know, back in, back in March, it, it was actually an acceptable reason, excuse, dare I say, um, because we were kind of all living through the pandemic and not really knowing what the next step was. But it, but it gets you thinking as a technologist, like some of these significant retail, you know, giants from a UK perspective, you know, kind of operate if they're not so like all sitting side by side inside their call center. Um, and then, you know, the, the flip side of that is I kind of draw the parallels to, you know, to, to my company, to Bullhorn. Um, we, we were born in the cloud as a, as a technology that we sell out into, obviously out into the recruitment market. Um, and so I guess very similar to Microsoft, everything we use is, um, is, is sort of like cloud-based as well. Um, you know, from, from our CRM through to, you know, any of our online documentation, even through to our telephony. So as, um, as a business in terms of, um, you, you know, business continuity and being able to carry on talking to our customers and connecting and providing, um, you, know, you know, whether it's information about applications or finance or support or whatever that is, then it really was as simple as us um, to, to sort of like, you know, laptops go home and you connect to your home internet and you kind of work in, in the same way as you would do in the office. So, um, but that, you know, that, that was a, dare I say, a privileged position because everything we use is, is kind of built inside a cloud or the cloud, um, you know, it kind of goes back to my previous comment around, you know, that, that digital transformation journey that was very much part of that, uh, you know, um, everyday dialogue, if you will. So like web webinar uh, content, so like pre pre COVID. But I, I think what we've definitely seen, if I, if I think about the engagements 
I've had it in the market with, with agencies, certainly over the last you know, five, six months, you know, that, that thing that would never happen, you know, this, this global pandemic that kind of stops us working, that we don't need to worry about because it's never going to happen, happened. And I think that brought the reality of not, not having, not necessarily the right breadth of tech stack, but the correct stack up of tech stack that will enable, enable sort of like homework and a work in an, an environment. And, you know, there's, there's been so many conversations around, you know, is this the end of the office environment? And I, you know, personally, I don't believe it is. Um, I think there's definitely a change abreast, but I don't think we're, we're you know, we're going to see sort of like mass exodus from offices uh, across the UK. What I do believe is that we're going to sort of like emerge from this with a lot more homeworking because we've, we've kind of crossed that pain threshold as a uh, UK economy, if you will. Um, and also a lot more flexible working inside that. And, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of, I would say, progressive businesses, progressive agencies, seriously looking to accelerate the ad uh, adoption of technologies such as and any cloud technology, if you will, that can support that working from home situation as, as a result of what they've lived through. And they realize, um, you know, the business disru disruption that it's caused as a result of. Yeah, I think I agree. And I think the other, like, what I like about, I guess, my experience um, in the last six months is that although everything's almost perceived technology based and, you know, that it, we must have the tech, actually what it does is humanize a lot of the interactions as well. Because I don't know, like for me, I, I think I, I might have a corporate voice on the phone. So there's a certain tone that I'll use and I'll walk around the office on, on business. Um, whereas at home, you know, it's the personality and everything else. And I, I think when you're in a, a different environment, then actually more of your person, your true personality potentially comes out as well, which is a really nice, warm kind of sentiment, um, especially when we're all kind of dealing with the unknowns and everything else. And, and Lisa, I'll go to you. I mean, it's like, you know, working in the office, we've already met Skywalker, the, the dog, or Han Solo, sorry, what was the dog? Yeah, it's very important. Oh. So Oh, no. Just see him in the background there. I actually think he heard me get his name <laughs> running out the door. But it's things like that. And I think, do you agree that, you know, although it's challenging and it's tough, actually having, you know, sometimes a, a more human and, and real uh, interaction uh, changes the dynamics of what we perceive as business? I absolutely think so. And any of us that have had kids of a non-teenage age and teenage and had to homeschool them for the last six months know that if you speak to an eight-year-old who is going to be a criminal mastermind and therefore is probably going to make a great recruiter when he's old enough, um, <laughs> don't come into my home office, I'm about to make a call. Why did I even say that out loud? Just knows he went, when he wants something, he's going to come in in the middle of that call because he knows that I'm going to give him whatever the hell he wants because I've got someone on the call. I mean, luckily I'm in the office today, so I don't need to worry about that. And they're back at school and everyone's breathing a sigh of relief, I'm hoping. Those of you with kids, put your hands up and, and wave. But I, I think that, you know, going back to one of Andy's points, it's that crossing that pain threshold, working from home. For a lot of people, working from home was only painful because of kids. <laughs> God forbid, pain and kids being in the same sentence. You can tell I've had an interesting six months. They're back, at, they're back at school now, so we can, we can create an environment. IKEA are going to do a bomb out of all of us that dismantled our home offices 10 years ago and turned them into a guest room, and now we realise that working from home needs to be more than just a dining room table. So everyone's now dropped the kids off, they're off to IKEA, they've got the home working space sorted, although Andy look, Andy's looks quite nice, and I think I'd like to go down to where um, Hung is right now because he looks like he's got some sweets on the things there. But it's that I'm a recruiter, my process should be intuitive enough, I'm going to automate it. Going back to what Andy said about LinkedIn, has anyone been on a training course to learn LinkedIn? When we do studies of recruiters and their workflows and their processes, they're on average spending 50% of their day using the free version of LinkedIn without any training and still not placing candidates. And when we studied one of our clients that had 70 recruiters, that added up to a million pounds worth of salaries every year using a system that wasn't actually helping them hit target. Now, I don't want that much money to train them to use LinkedIn. Maybe 900,000 will do me. They can get <laughs> an extra 100 grand back with them. But when you go to any system that recruiters got, if the process is not clear, working from home and automating it won't fix anything. It'll actually make people feel more disconnected from their business. 
you'll then end up with morale and stress issues. And we've been talking about mental health a lot. But I think it's really around, I'm working from home now. Is my environment safe to do that? And more importantly, are the processes and reporting mechanisms on my CRM system, for example, clear enough that on a bad day I can get up look at my planner and know exactly what I need to do. And I think that's where the recruitment industry has got a real opportunity right now to say, let's get our workflows really nailed down. Let's make sure our systems will help us create the time that we need to have those conversations working from home with our clients. So if our whip it walks through in the middle of a conversation, it simply strengthens the relationship we've got with our clients, as opposed to the fact that we've just not got the time to develop those relationships in the first place. So again, I'm quite positive that if we, if we nail this, we, we're, we're gonna do quite well in 2021. I think so. And I think um, on the point of training and um, technologies and things like that, even even things like um, to, to a degree, we get trained, um, certainly in, in my arena on how to present a keynote speech. So, you know, how you mm -hmm. present to a stage, how you capture it, how you deliver impact. But how you do that digitally is a different game entirely. And there's tiny, it's very simple things and things like that. And I think, you know, interviews and, you know, that candidate time and things like that, it's all going to be done remotely now. And how do we, you know, how do we encourage that type of training and things like that? I mean, Hunt, are these things that we need to be mindful of more so now? Uh, these, these tiny little nuggets that maybe aren't put into consideration? Is, is this what you're hearing uh, in the market? I think, I think the opportunity is there. I mean, ultimately, we're talking about efficiencies, but at least it's on about, you know, making sure that recruiters are op optimized for this. Um, a great deal of it is about the process, but um, what the, 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 the shocking shift to remote has done is, is caused us all to realize there's more efficient ways to do things. Um, and you can get away with a lot of things uh, uh, that oh, we... Oh, come on. Please, no. Please. What's, oh. what's happened? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it just started for a bit. I thought, uh, carry on. Sorry, hon. Yeah, Rob, you're still on mic, you know. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Thanks. I mean, you're talking about scheduling tools. I mean, everyone knows about things like Calendarly now and stuff like that. That's going to give you a micro improvement on a process that everyone has to do. Um, but in fact, it adds up. You know, recruiters interview and schedule a lot of meetings. Um, I don't know how many, uh, back in my agency days, it would probably suck up 10, 20% of my day looking and chasing around for a time to speak to somebody. Um, now, if you've got a bit of technology that can help you get rid of that um, or at least mitigate some of it, then of course you should deploy that. Um, and I think I'd be very surprised if companies are not using this type of tooling, you know, scheduling software, um, you know, asynchronous type of tech. Um, this is the sort of thing that we need to, we need to get to. Recruiters are very good in a synchronous environment. Don't get me wrong. That's where we can do the sales. This is where it's critical. This is why, you know, it is important to get people on the phone, in the video, back in the day, in a meeting, because that's where our, you know, relationship skills come into play. Um, but there's all, there's all other bits around that that can be done asynchronously. And I'd love to see agencies step into, um, you know, looking at the efficiencies that accrue throughout all of their teams and see whether they can get there. As Lisa said with her example, um, you've got to add up all of the micro sort of moments that your, ta your team is wasting um, in trying to do everything synchronously when in fact there's loads of stuff you can, you can use tech to give a quick solve for. Nice, no, like it. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think um, it's, it, it's, I guess, measuring who's going to want to jump up and realize and make that change um, and going through. And, uh, Andy and I were going so I've got another stat for you because we, we, as, a, as a training provider, my job is to tell people who think they don't need training, but actually if they have some training, they'll make some more money. And it's obviously that Jerry Maguire show me the money stat. But we figured out if we save a recruiter, one recruitment consultant an hour a day, and we can do that standing on our heads. Um, and they work a 48 week year and they bill a hundred grand, which may or may not be a good start. Then we will create enough time for everyone in that business to generate an extra 12 and a half K's worth of pipeline, which you can't shake a stick at that. Can you? It's just like that to me is really compelling whether or not we automate a process or we figure out what the process is so the humans can be more automated in their thinking. 
um, or we create time in a recruiter's diary, ultimately what has to happen with technology and recruitment and process is we say, what is the opportunity cost for not doing it? But actually, more importantly, if we do it, how much more money potentially could that recruiter generate for the business? And if you've got 10 recruiters, and that's 125 grand a year, just for looking at the tech stack, figuring out what the processes are, and saying, where, how can we make that easier? And um, is there a, tr a problem between the chair and the keyboard that stops that technology from being awesome and automated? That for me is what every recruitment leader needs to, is, is normally thinking about is the cost but actually I'm thinking about what, how much money could they make if they get this right? No, I completely agree. And it's, it's, it's almost like you're jumping ahead in my questions there because you've not segued into generating that buy-in and, and how, how can we help and how do we elevate that conversation into making real business change, um, you know, for, for the grown-ups. Uh, so the next point is to that, how do you generate the buy-in um, and, and the investment? So I, I think we've touched on that people are spending money on tech and some of it's very good. How do we then orchestrate the conversation to deliver the results as to Lisa's point, or even in, you know, maybe in Andy's um, arena or my arena, where it's the autom automation to deliver the time back to Lisa's point to then generate a net new pipeline or the human elements that do that as well. And um, what, what are some good examples of, um, you know, ROI or actually getting that buy-in at a senior level. Um, so Andy, I'll come back to you, Lisa. I'll, I'll finish on uh, you closing on that one. So I, I, I would say on this point, actually the blue sky is the reverse of, of kind of the question you've just asked. And I think, I think Hung so I hit upon this point earlier in the fact that for, for real change to take place and, you know, let, let's kind of not, um, you know, mince words here in terms of you know digital transformation and so like adopting new technology or investing in new technology. That that is a a significant change. Uh, of course, that can vary depending on what that technology is. But at its extreme, it's a significant uh, change for business that you know in in reality will create some business disruption. Um, and you kind of have your typical bell curve when you're looking at productivity as you're, as you're kind of through, going through a normal change process um, until you kind of reach, you know, reach that optimal piece as you come out the other side and actually start generating ROI. But in, in my um, opinion, where I've seen this executed the best is the change comes from the top. So Hung's point around CEO, CFO, so I've been the driver of this and actually driving that through the business. Now, I think, I think your question, Rob, was more kind of posed around, you know, if there's a, if there's a view for creation of change, let's say middle management or, you know, within the business, how, how does that kind of accelerate upwards? Um, and, you know, that for me, that always is an uphill battle. Um, um, but um, whether you're kind of coming top down or selling, if you will, uh, bottom up inside a company, then there's only really two business justifications, business justifications, which have got a commercial value attached to them in terms of, you know, investing to, to kind of create that change. And that's either, you know, driving an increase of performance, you know, whether you want to be looking at, you know, bottom line profit, EBITDA or, um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, placements and kind of revenue that can, comes off the back of that, or you're solving a business critical issue that, that's causing your business pain, be that, um, again, financial measure, but, you know, increased cost, maybe there's a you know, legal compliance that's going to leave you exposed. But, but you know, at a, a real summary level, the business justification has got to fall into one of those two buckets, or will it end up coming into one of those, uh, one of those two buckets? And that, you know, that, that, in my opinion, is kind of where, we see the best engagement as we're, as we're sort of working with our, certainly our clients in terms of driving um, adoption or change of, of new technology or even review of technology um, because they have a demonstrable outcome that they're trying to get to. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical question to ask, but, um, but I do quite, quite frequently. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to going back to anyone who's adopting new technology and asking the question, why did you why did you like invest in that in the first place? What was what was the reasons for you, for you doing that? And unfortunately, um, you know, too, too often than I'd like to admit, 
then you know the answers that come back are probably not as robust as they want to be if you are writing a you know blue chip business case for for making a significant investment and you know technology is absolutely um, an enabler for a lot of the things we're talking about today but it but it's not a tick in the box solution um, and kind of everything else that we talked about previously comes into play here in terms of uh, in terms of adoption and execution and kind of driving the right processes in, inside the agency. Um, but I think it, it absolutely starts with a quantifiable, as in, you know, pound no, euro value um, in terms of what you're trying to drive from that investment, because it is an investment. Technology shouldn't be seen as, you know, corporate vanity. It, it's there to provide a, a solution, an enabler to one of the two uh, sort of previous points around, you know, improvements in, in a, a financial number or kind of mitigating business risk. No, I completely agree. And I, just before I go to you, Lisa, I mean, for me, what I also do is I very much live in the customer's world. So I will go and actively become a recruiter because um, I want to take that message that, you know, we all understand to, to your point how to build, you know, business cases and proposals and things like that for the top level. But if we can take the voice of the customer, be it the, the recruiter, um, live and breathe that and really understand some of that pain um, across the entire journey, we can really then drive impact because I guarantee that most of those lead, potentially that, that leadership doesn't realize uh, what's going on in the coalface uh, more often than not. I, Lisa, would you share that sentiment? Mm, I'd add something to it. So yes, I share it, but I think often in the recruitment sector's drive to improve the candidate and client experience, they often neglect the recruiter experience and they don't neglect it because they're nasty people. They neglect it because there's only, I've only got two hands. I mean, Andy will know this. He's got more than two kids. It's like, oh God, which one do you grab in the back of the car? They're a bit old now. I've only got two kids. <laughs> But we're a bit of a, we're a bit of a four C's mentality at Barclay Jones, candidates, clients, colleagues, and cash. And yeah. often um, I, I get upset as a training professional and a change professional at um, how much money is being spent on stuff that people don't know how to use effectively to free up the times so they can have really great conversations that are the things that improve the candidate and client experience. And I wrote a blog years ago called basically sub the candidate experience. What about the recruiter experience? And I'm seeing at my ripe old age of X that things haven't really changed. We're just dumping more data and systems onto recruiters and hoping to God that because they're young, that they can figure it out. And of course, they can't figure it out if they're not even in the office and they've not had the training. So I think the recruiter experience personally for me is at the heart of the change that needs to happen. My name's Jane or John Smith. I'm sat at home or in the office. I've got this technology and this data. What do I need to do to make a fee and how easy could it be for me to do that? What am I missing? What steps could I take to make that easier? Because I guarantee if we improve the recruiter experience, that the majority of recruiters will by definition pass on that positive experience to candidates and clients, which will ultimately improve pipelines, improve retention of all of those three C's. Um, and I think it's a bit easier for a recruitment leader to improve the recruiter experience than they realize. And I think it's probably easier right now as well, because everyone's like rabbit caught in headlights, to improve a recruiter's experience than potentially a candidate's or a client's, because at least you can give them, well, I was going to say you can give them a cover, you can't touch them, can you? But um, you can at least, you know, you, you know, you have that within your control as a recruitment leader. If nothing else, you've got a team of people who are going... I can't admit to you that I don't know what I'm doing right now because if I do, it puts me at risk. You know, the average recruitment consultant is not going to ring up and go, I can't wait to come back to work, but you know what, when I get back, could you please give me some training? They're not going to do that. They're probably terrified of admitting that they're potentially, they don't really know. And anyone that's been on holiday for more than two weeks knows the brain is a, a, tri brain is a tricky bugger. If you've been on maternity leave or paternity leave or sabbatical, and by the way, none of those three, three things apply to the current situation that we're in. We're in a much worse situation than someone's gone on maternity leave for six months and comes back and everything's just clockwork. Everyone's coming back to a new whatever it is. So I think that recruitment leaders have to grab this now and say, let's admit it wasn't perfect when it all did kick off. Let's admit the people that need the most help are probably unlikely to put their hand up and go, pick me. Um, but actually, if all they do is look at the tech and go, well, why won't it just do the things that we bought it to do? 
And Andy's right, you know, look back at why you bought it in the first place. If it's not doing its job, it's probably because a human's not telling it to. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I guess I wanted to come to you because there's an element of all of this that we haven't really touched on. Um, very much around, you know, the kind of recruiter and the facing to the candidate, facing to the client. What about the cash? What about the finance operations within a recruiter? Are there things that, you know, if things are going to be consumed, I guess, in a, you know, there's, there's instances of um, candidates that are needing to be consumed in very agile ways in terms of the rates and the way they build and, and that flow. Are there things that we need to be mindful of around the finance of the back end that has ultimately an impact on the cash flow of the business, but more importantly, potentially paying a commission to a recruiter too. Are there there things that you've seen and heard that need to be looked at there? Or or is it kind of left to, you know, those big old systems and not really touched because it can't really change? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of inertia. If, 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 you're, if you build a process around a technology, um, it's, it's very painful to switch off, off that bit of technology. Um, a big part of the reason, I think, why, um, you know, we, we, we kind of uh, instinctively have a problem with change of any type is because we recognize that that's a painful transition uh, in traditional sense. Um, and we resist it because we've got an operating process with or without technology, but we have a way of doing it now. Um, it has worked because I've still got a job and I'm still billing or whatever. It's working, uh, maybe not optimally, but it's working. And any time someone says, hey, listen, here's a new bit of tech that can do this, or here's a better process that can do that, or you know, resistance to training and recruiters is also part of this. It takes people out of their day. You know, why would I want to do that? They should be on the phone. They should be sending emails, whatever. Um, all of this is um, about... How do we um, uh, uh, take away, the, if you like, the optimal productivity or the perceived optimal productivity of that recruiter? Um, so I guess what we really need to do is to kind of have more vision from the top of the business. They need to understand, and I hope there's a bunch of business leaders actually watching this webinar. I assume they are. Um, uh, RAC, I think, really, you know, uh, is business owner focused. So I think everyone who's watching this probably already has the instinct that they want to do better for their team, want to do better for their business. Um, uh, And, you know, getting improvements with technology and effective implementation of tech is a big part of that. Um, One thing that hasn't been talked about, which I just want to touch on before we move on to the next point, um, is that if you want the utilization of the technology to happen, um, you really want to involve the users much earlier on in the process than is traditionally the case in most corporate contexts, and especially, I think, in agency contexts, um, where the procurement process, the decision-making process is all locked away um, by C-level, let's say, or finance or IT, or somebody makes that choice. And then the, the operators, the people who are doing the work, uh, are then serviced with a tool to say, get on with it, you now should do better because we've just spent this money on you. Those people need to be involved in the first conversation. Um, and if you really want adoption, you need to get your staff committed to the idea. And if they don't commit to the idea or you haven't won the argument before you've even bought anything, then you probably shouldn't go ahead with that purchase. Uh, you need to make the, the, the case prior to putting vendors into, into interview. So I think that's something, you know, we know in, in change management, in recruiting, I think we need to learn this lesson. I, I, sorry, Rob, just to jump in there, I totally, totally agree with what, what Hung's saying there. Uh, I guess where I slightly disagree is that I don't think that's unique to recruitment as a, as a sector, the whole change management process. You know, I've worked in sectors outside recruitment, it's exactly the same. Um, and so, you know, 100%, Kind of driving driving adoption in terms of engagement in you know the the pains the business issues that have been faced by by the organization or agencies in our case and getting that buy-in that something needs to change from within the ranks super important um i, I don't think it's kind of unique to us as an industry um but i also think we can learn from you know good technology implementations which, which are as Hung said kind of driven across the business and not you know a decision that's made in the boardroom and a check that's signed and you know monday morning the shiny new piece of uh, kits in there and well of course you should now choose it because you're all young people and you know kind of get on with it that's you know that that's kind of not how adoption of technology works 
Yeah, no, I agree. That leads us into, I guess, the, one of the first points that was actually asked was around how do we, how, what, what technologies do you need to produce actionable business intelligence? And I guess, you know, it's, it's more around, you know, how do you get that insight at a higher level? Um, and lots of people talk about dashboards um, and things like that. And I think you have a lot of disparate systems in, in across functions, across businesses as well. Um, and I think what's come out of some of these conversations is that, um, you know, there is a disconnect between functions of a business. Um, you know, the, the recruiters potentially and the finance teams aren't really in sync in terms of how things are equally important, right, as, as we've discussed today. But very different kind of persona, personas, very different technologies as well. Uh, you know, is there value in you know somebody having a single pulse of the business in a as real time as possible to then inform uh, where those changes and priorities and also then measure um, to the points that have been raised around the technology investments too? Because if this function's not performing or we can't see the performance maybe there's something that we need to address around that. I think it's becoming more critical, as we'll all agree, with remote working, having a pulse on the business um, without seeing people physically on a phone or things like that is, is becoming critical. Are there, are there I guess, tools and uh, best practices that we've seen uh, between us um, around that and examples that we could give? Um, I guess, hand back to you, because uh, I guess you cover a, there's a much broader sense in terms of uh, the industry that you've seen, tools in your experience, but tools that you're hearing about today. Are oh, you on mute now? Sorry, Rob, did you see me? Yes, I did. Okay, yeah. I beg your pardon for this mute business. I'll stop doing that. Um, the answer is yes. Um, how you do Pulse is through two broad, broad ways. Um, you either trust the staff to tell you, um, so there's an entire suite of tools to help you do that, where basically it's usually a mobile app. Um, you know, they'll give you an update on their sentiment. It's a, a bunch of questions maybe that ask you about their mood or how they're feeling or whatever. It's in effect filling in a spreadsheet, but getting everyone to do it. Um, so there's one way, there's kind of a broad suite of products that do it that way. The other way to do it is to not ask and simply monitor and track. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of really interesting technologies that do that. Um, uh, I think the term for it is organizational network analytics. Um, so these are technologies that basically track stuff like what is the volume of emails being sent today compared to yesterday? Um, who is sending those emails? Um, uh, who, what happens if Rob sends an email compared to what happens when Lisa sends an email? Do people respond to those people in different ways? Um, so this kind of technology does exist also. And uh, it's super interesting because it does, I think, genuinely give you a picture as to what's going on in the business to the level that we probably haven't had access to before. You'll quickly find out basically who are the bullshit is in your business and who are actually the productive people because you can track it via um, uh, email and, and other digital media. Additional caveat to this, the shift to everything to remote, by the way, digitizes a lot of previously analog processes that were not trackable because they were analog, meaning they were in person. Um, so now, now that everything's a video, now that everything has to be digital, it means it's trackable. So a smart CEO will be looking at all of this digitization and thinking, actually, I could get to know my business a hell of a lot better than I did before, simply by surveying the room and figuring out whether people are busy. Um, these days, you have much better tooling to do it. Big caveat, obviously you've got massive privacy issues with all of this. You're gonna have legislative problems with this as well. These technologies tend to be deployed in the US more than Europe, more than UK also, um, but they are, they are around and you can see the value, but it is a big kind of challenge in terms of ethically, is it the right thing to do? What is the cultural impact of implementing technology of this type? How can we sell it? Uh, we talked about sort of getting people to endorse this. How can we sell it? Um, to uh, our staff, uh, this is fundamentally a good thing. All of those questions, I think, remain uh, unanswered, which is why most companies go to the first option, which is uh, get your staff to tell you. Exactly. And Lisa, I'll come to you on this. Um, I guess it's the comments um, that you've seen around, you know, I guess how to train and think about the recruiter um, and, and how that impacts them. Um, is there a fear that, somebody's now not just looking over your shoulder what you're doing but constantly now looking at literally everything you do and 
how do, how do we manage that communication in a positive way? Because obviously there's a benefit for the business, but we want to also then encourage uh, maybe diff- the recruiter to do things in different ways. So, you know, tracking those emails and making sure everything's in the system or, or on the data entry. And then does that allude to more admin and does, is that counterintuitive? I think whether we whether we like it or not, we are we, we and we always have been um, in the market in need of a single source of truth. Okay, so whether it be a whiteboard, God forbid, if they still exist, or screens, if we're going to really really go up market that plugs into a laptop somewhere, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of phrase this by disagreeing totally with her. I think we're at risk of turning this conversation and starting it with start using the tech you've got more effectively into a but why don't you buy a load more text you can measure what you're doing i'm like no because actually the average client that we go into doesn't log all of their leads they don't actively track the recruitment workflow um, through the systems that they already have so even if you did buy um, stuff to measure what a recruiter is doing is gonna it's just gonna tell you the truth which is they're not potentially following process and by the way i love recruiters i married one so it's just because it's that problem between the chair and the keyboard again. For me, it's around sticking with the process, managing the process through the system, creating time in your day to be a more effective recruiter relating to the candidate force or whatever it's going to be. And then at that stage, you can say, right, how effective am I at converting a lead into an opportunity, into a placement, into an invoice? How effective am I at, at sourcing candidates at the moment? The current national UK stat is 13 hours a week on one placement. And again, pre-COVID stat, um, which is 12 hours too long for my liking, maybe even 12 and a half hours too long. Candidates that are, are not as loyal as they were 20 years ago. So I'm not a fan of buying loads more tech. I think the, the tech cube 19 pulse within bullhorn for example, allows recruiters to be bloody. If, by the way, if you've got bullhorn and you don't use pulse, shame on you. It's, mind-blowing and I'm not trying to pitch it here but a system that tells me who I should speak to when I should speak to them what time of day I should do it and how I should do it that for me is groundbreaking for some recruiters and they've got it right in front of them let alone if we buy loads of tech that potentially takes us beyond the GDPR pale so I don't know I would again like to go back to basics if I'm allowed to use that analogy and say can we start running our recruitment workflows effectively through the systems that we've got and then looking at the reporting mechanisms on those systems to deliver that single source of truth. I, I completely agree. And it comes back to one of the first points we made and kind of Andy and I obviously sit in a similar boat here where it's, you know, what is the approach? How do we help a customer understand across those dimensions what the current landscape looks like, and bring that right down to measure its performance and whether that's the process, the people, the technology um, or, or the customer or the client understand where we start and then break that down, not just to blindly throw things on the top, it's just to start building this up sequentially on, as, a, as a performance. And it's gonna hit some metrics and whether that is to reduce days out, uh, sales outstanding or that if that's to reduce candidate placement time or the cost of the placement, start to really understand that and put that into bite-sized digestible um, phases, if you like, of, a, of transformation to the opening point there, where it's a combination of change of process, people role, technology, and customer engagement as well. Um, I think we're, we're just up to 41 past. There's a couple of questions here. Um, so we'll go to the uh, chat here. Um, I think we've had a question around um, some technology here around administering events. Um, we've got disparate systems here. We can take that one offline. Um, obviously with Microsoft, we have, um, quite a good events uh, package within our marketing uh, suite within Dynamics. Um, so I'll drop you a note with uh, some of the options there. I think Andy, you not so much on the event side, but certainly on the CRM side, you'll have a, a response around that as well. So perhaps we can uh, just collectively go back on that one there. Sure. Uh, that one there. Um, I think you've, uh, Lisa, you've had a, a one-to-one request. Um, I think you've gone back on that one. And then, Oh, Andy, a big query around a lot of ATS systems, non-EU servers. Ooh. Uh, yeah, that, that one's around the corner, right? So, um, sorry, I can't answer the question, but let me... Um... Oh, so, so, okay, so, let, sorry, apologies, I'll read it. So, big query I have is around a lot of the ATS systems, which typically have non-EU servers, 
Uh, given uh, Scrims 2 decision at the end of July, uh, invalidating Privacy Shield and a lot of non-US ATS systems can't be used anymore. What's your view on selecting an ATS system now? Um, and also, how does that potentially impact with Schrems 3 coming, um, obviously with the in, in the US uh, element of that as well? Um, I think, Lisa, you've... Oh, hang on. Let me just scroll back. Uh, that's from uh, Geraldine. Um, so I think, Andy, if you, if you wanted to take that Yeah, one. if I quickly jump in on that one. So, um, so yeah, the, the Privacy Shield was essentially stood down. Um, it's like middle, middle of July, um, which, um, which kind of causes... Uh, you know, uh, repetition, if you will, disruption is kind of in markets like beyond obviously recruitment because this is all around data and data privacy and um, data movement um, is essentially across the globe, but in that case from EU to, to uh, North America. Um, so I, I don't know where that individual will be based, I'm guessing UK, because we then have a new dynamic at, at, the, end of, uh, at the end of this year whereby the UK is not uh, going to be part of um, uh, mail in Europe, the EU, um, and so you, you kind of have that additional um, uh, piece coming into play at the back end. So the questions that I would be advising you to ask um, so like the ATS provider would be essentially where, it's two, twofold really, where is the data uh, stored um, and where is the data processed? Um, and by processed, I mean the potential to access that data. So, um, so people that, you know, day-to-day -day kind of, um, a good example would be the support of your ATS system. So if you know, if someone, Andy, sorry, just to oh, cut in. What sorry, about? I missed that. Say that again. Sorry, it's about one minute. We're uh, to. All oh, right. Okay. Sorry. So, um, so typically, um, and I can speak on behalf of Bullhorn here. What what we've done is put in place um, standard contractual clauses within all of our so like group company businesses, so that we can access that data legally. So like under the EU guidelines, it's also covered by GDPR. Uh, from areas outside of uh, of the EU, um, but that that would be that would be the question that you would need to ask your ACS provider. But you know, people like Salesforce and Microsoft are the same boat. Um, um, I've got these standard contractual clauses in place that enable um, business as usual to continue. Awesome, brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Um, so we're at the uh, top of the hour. Um, so thank you very much. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks for all the questions. Um, if we didn't get back to you, apologies, but we have captured that. So um, by, uh, I think Lisa's been going through pretty much every single one. So we've got a contact there for all of your inquiries. Um, on behalf of the panel, uh, thank you guys uh, for supporting. Uh, and obviously REC, thank you for uh, setting this up. Um, I think we'll close it off there. Uh, unless there's any questions. We'll say no. Guys, girls, thanks very Amen. much for your time.